Hello and welcome to this afternoon's programme, live from our studio in the heart of West London. West London Business are delighted to produce this webcast as part of Real Estate Live, a week-long series of virtual events designed to keep the UK's property and regeneration sectors talking and showcase the number of investment opportunities present around the country. Topics focus on places, infrastructure, investment, architecture and public sector um, with a week that brings hundreds of different businesses, organisations, groups and bodies together across interactive webinars and webcasts to promote the UK. On this webcast, I'll be exploring with my panel the leadership West London demands to deliver opportunities in this new COVID-19 era. My panel who've been leading change in their respective domains for decades are Liz Peace, CBE, Chair of the Old Oak and Park Royal Development Corporation, Ian Little, Managing Director, Planning and Advisory at WSP, and Ewan Lloyd-Smith, Director at D2. Neil Impiazzi of Seagro unfortunately had to send his apologies. Throughout the programme, um, my colleague Pim will be monitoring your questions, um, so please keep them coming in um, on the YouTube live chat window. You just need to log in um, using a Google account or a YouTube account, um, and then you can fire away with your questions. Today's webcast is possible thanks to the support of the community of partners that came together to enable the Capital West London and West London business presence at MIPIM Cannes in March then June um, 2020, that never quite happened um, due to um, COVID-19. Um, you can see all those partners um, up on screen um, now and we, we thank them all. We hope that West London Explore, which you're going to hear a bit more about uh, shortly, um, and the West London events that we've been uh, able to deliver with the Capital West London team during Real Estate Live Week um, go some way to making up for the loss of, of can um, from the diary. So, on with today's programme. Um, first up, um, we're going to be hearing um, more about uh, West London Explore, um, an interactive um, guide to the world's most connected place um, and the investment driving its growth. Um, Ewan is going to uh, take us through um, Explore. Um, then we'll be introducing um, Ian um, to hear more about the report um, West London Delivering the Opportunities, which uh, WSP um, published last autumn, but we felt was deserving of much more um, discussion. Uh, and then we'll hear from Liz um, on the OPDC's emerging strategy um, and new focus on the Westlands area. Um, and after that, we're going to open up for what I'm sure will be a lively um, discussion um, between our panel uh, and uh, with the input from you, um, our viewers. So to kick off, um, we're, I'm delighted to welcome um, Ewan from D2. D2 have been partners of ours um, in the MIPIM project for several years now, um, have a highly innovative um, platform that is being used in all sorts of different ways by um, your customers um, on different sites and places and projects um, from what I've seen, um, Ewan. But we've been working together on um, on the West London Explore um, version of your, your D2 um, platform, which is now in its second incarnation. Um, and from the sneak preview I had earlier of uh, of the video you're about to talk us through, um, I think we may see some little little snippets of the next version of um, D2 Explore and some of those uh, some of those 3D elements. Um, so very very yeah. excited to be able to to share that um, now. But uh, over to, to to you, Ewan, really just to um, to talk us through um, where to find West London Explore and then how to how to navigate it. Okay. Well, thanks, Andrew. Uh, like you said. The West London Explore is a model uh, of West London that we've been working on for the last two years. And the key here is to really move away from lengthy documents and get users to understand often complex issues in context with each other uh, and really get access to that information. So when it starts to play, we'll see that the model is available on the West London website just at the top. Uh, and you click through to it, and it opens up um, full screen, a nice map of West London. 
when users click through into it and explore the map, we see uh, initially some sites that are part of the sponsors that we use, but also each site has rich media pop-outs and they could be text and pictures. They can be um, high quality videos that link off to sources like YouTube or Vimeo. Uh, but then they can also uh, link through to existing marketing material and documents that you may already have. For example, with Heathrow and it links through to um, that this example is their target net zero document. So it's a really good place for people to go and find information all in one place. Uh, but the real key to it is guiding people on a journey or a story across the region. And here we're looking at how West London is the world's most connected place. As the story progresses, the map on the right hand side starts to change and users get to see information um, and facts all in one place where they can change and, and understand with it. So this will just scroll through for a little bit. You can see those, those key areas start to change as we move along. And it's really trying to convey what is both unique and exceptional about uh, the West London area. And, and there's lots, there's lots we've been able to pack in you and isn't it there? I mean, it's yeah, there's, there's so, so much, so there. much that's unique. <laughs> that's it. Uh, but being guided along is fine, but we're, we're free spirits, I suppose, and we like to investigate them around. This is some of the, the new functionality you mentioned earlier. This is the, the 3D version. Um, so all that, of them we've there got, is we've got a, it's the Sky Campus, Ostley, I think we've just flown into there, isn't it? That's it. This is a creative enterprise zone that we're seeing. Um, and that really just gets users to be able to move around the area on their own, understand the opportunities that are there and play around it. Um, people can also turn on the information that they want to see themselves. So across on the left hand side, there's a little pop out panel which allows users to turn on information layers as they want. So um, we can start seeing the, uh, the future transport links that are coming through. They will turn on in a second. There we go. Uh, and uh, West London has some great green areas, so they will come on. We can see the 1,300 hectares of green space uh, that make up West London. So it's really a great place for people to understand opportunities. Um, but key to it is that it's made for mobile. So the Explore model has been built to be fast and responsive. You don't need any fancy hardware to do it. Uh, in fact, it works remarkably well on phones, as you can see here, and anything that's touch screen, people can just whiz around, carry their, we, we often say you carry a portfolio around in your pocket when you, when you have this. Um, so it's a nice snappy tool that you can just access from anywhere. And it really starts to break down those barriers to engagement so people can access it. Uh, and that's it, really. If you haven't had a go already, head over to the West London website uh, and click through on the link. And you, you reminded me, Ewan, with your sort of last um, sort of screenshot there, that one of the additions that we've been able to make this year through our partnership with Capital West London um, is the opportunities layer for, for, for development sites that are um, seeking uh, in investment. Um, and I think if you if, if um, folk click through to that and then click on the specific pins, um, that then hyperlinks um, folk over to the Capital West London website um, and the in additional information um, they may, may be seeking on specific sites which uh, has been a, a great addition for, for 2020 that's it exactly well we'll be coming back to you I think a bit later on um, Ewan to get some of your views um, on the West London secrets of success and uh, how we can be using D2, D2 Explore um, to, to, to make our conversations um, even more effective um, but for, for, for now I'm, I'm gonna I think hand over to Ian um, from WSP um, 
WSP, I think it's a well-known, um, I'm sure, to all of our um, viewers and have been involved in so many developments across um, the northwest um, of the capital over um, many um, decades. But uh, last autumn, I think it was at the Capital West London Growth Summit. Um, you were able, Ian, to, um, to to launch this 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 report um, on West London um, delivering the opportunities. So, I really look forward to a reminder. I think for our viewers of um, all the ideas and information that you you packed into that report to uh, in, in, inspire um, leadership in the sub region moving forward. Ian. Yeah, uh, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, very much and I um, enjoyed the previous presentation. I'm looking forward to doing some exploring uh, <laughs> myself. Um, but as, as you said in your introduction, WSPs had a, a long-standing interest in, in West London from numerous developments to a recent work as lead designer on the HS2 Old Oak Common Superhub, which of course gained planning approval last month. Turning to our reports, which um, hopefully you'll, you'll see the cover on uh, uh, on screen in a, in a moment. Um, ah, there it is. We wanted this to complement earlier work by London First, ACOM, and the London Urban Transformation Commission. They produced a report uh, proposing a new approach to transforming London. Uh, a really good piece of work, uh, but. You know, we have to accept that reaching agreement on new approaches uh, takes time. And meanwhile, London has an ongoing need for some 66,000 new homes per year with just over a quarter of those in West London. So for that reason, we wanted to see what we could learn from the successful delivery of homes, jobs and social infrastructure under the existing planning system and, and governance. We held discussions with some of the developers behind the successful information uh, implementation of some inspiring projects, uh, including uh, Mitsui Fidoshin to talk about their work in the eight billion pounds white city uh, opportunity area, uh, with Argent about their, their work on the, the vibrant new city quarter at King's Cross Central, and with Quintain, uh, about their work on delivery at Wembley Park. In all of those discussions, we were exploring the art of the possible. Uh, and that was the focus of our report. We were not looking for a new vision for West London. Uh, in our view, it had a perfectly good vision already, defined by Liz and the team at OPDC, the GLA and the West London boroughs. So we wanted to identify practical approaches to achieving delivery of, of that vision, to get delivery done, as someone might say. Now, let's look at uh, some of the findings uh, which appear on pages 12 to 15 of the original report uh, and are hopefully coming up on screen in a moment. These uh, summarize uh, the the, the key themes which came out of our case study discussions. And of course, maintaining a clear focus on delivery spans across all of these themes. Uh, on transport, the sites that we looked at had existing infrastructure to provide good public transport connectivity. And there were further upgrades in the pipeline thanks to public sector support and investment. Uh, in land, uh, the, the land ownership and, and title issues were resolvable. And this is of, often a complex area uh, which uh, can uh, slow down uh, the ability to deliver developments. So resolving those, as explained to us by the developers, was a really important success factor. Funding, uh, in each case, was optimised and, and managed by being able to sequence uh, revenue opportunities uh, and then to recycle uh, that uh, to help fund uh, future development. So that helped to manage the, the cash flow profile. And patient capital uh, was a you know, very 
important factor uh, coming from your know, patient capital from investors who shared the developers' long-term vision, uh, but were able to support uh, building at pace. And in terms of public and private collaboration, uh, the relationships with the, the boroughs, uh, working with local leaders to establish places that enhanced opportunities for local people and fitted with local economic development plans. Cultural assets uh, were often key to creating value through placemaking and establishing a strong brand. And they were often based on, on local uh, architectural and cultural heritage. Uh, and you might recognize some recent examples in, in London, such as the cultural heritage from an old cold coal yard, a biscuit factory, a bottle store, or an old vinyl record factory. So there was some very clever uh, branding uh, from those cultural assets. They didn't have to be you know, amongst the seven wonders of the world. And then lastly, uh, infrastructure and, and being able to invest in, in waste, uh, digital and energy uh, structure with public sector support. Now, in our reports, and if we can turn to the, the next slide showing the West London Orbital, we saw this as being a key project uh, for delivery in West London. This, uh, this scheme would enhance public transport connectivity across the area and help to facilitate up to 29,000 additional homes and 23,000 new jobs. It would improve connectivity between key opportunity areas which have been designated and existing town centres and communities and employment clusters. Uh, are very important to increase and to spread the benefits of sustainable growth. Uh, it would, for example, half the journey time between the Old Oak and Park Royal Opportunity Area and the Brent Cross Cricklewood Opportunity Area, as well as uh, substantially cutting journey times between Brent Cross West and Might have lost you briefly there, uh, Ian. I'm uh, hoping the uh, the connection is going to uh, to, to stabilise. Um, I don't, can you can you can you hear me okay okay again now, Ian? Or is the, the does the connection? I think the connection remains remains frozen. Well, I think Ian had fortunately almost got to the end of uh, his fantastic pitch um, for, uh, for, for for the report uh, published uh, published last autumn and certainly um, got us through um, all those key ingredients of success um, and then that critical reminder of really the flagship um, infrastructure project um, locally for West London, um, the, the, the West London Orbital that uh, provides those critical links um, between um, the new Brentford Football Club Stadium and the Community Stadium at Kew Bridge, um, going on up to Old Oak um, and then to, to Brent Cross and, and, uh, and Cr Cricklewood. Um, so really offering a lot of potential to take um, pressure um, off the North Circular. Um, now, I think we're at this point um, going to, whilst we re hopefully re-establish our link to Ian so we can bring him into the um, discussion um, shortly, um, I'm going to welcome um, Liz, li li Liz Peace. Um, I can't believe that it is now over a year since we were um, sat um, at MIPIM 2019 um, at one of our landing dinners reflecting then on how much change had happened for OPDC um, and the opportunities that you were, um, that you were navigating. Um, but goodness, you know how much has changed in those um, in in those sort of fifteen um, months. So really um, delighted to have you um, with us um, again today. Um, just sort of bring us bring us up to speed on um, on the sort of the emerging strategy um, and and help 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 our listeners kind of navigate some of those those twists and turns that you've um, been been dealing with in the past uh, fifteen months, Liz. 
Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me all right and this, this connection is working. The way I'm looking at myself, I look a bit fuzzy, but that just might be the lighting in my, <laughs> in my, in my study. Not quite your clarity, Andrew. Um, well, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to bring everybody up to date on what's going on at Old Open Park Royal. Um, somebody said to me when I took on the role of chairman, you know, you do realise, don't you, that big regeneration projects aren't easy. Oh, no, no problem. <laughs> but, but my God, they were absolutely right. You know, this has not, this has not been easy. And I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that something of this scale isn't quite as straightforward as we might perhaps have all first thought it would be. But I'm going to sort of do. I'm going to set a little bit of context and then explain where we've got to with our current thinking. And hopefully, won't exceed my my five to ten minutes. So I'll rattle through really quickly. So if I can have the first slide, please. That going to does that work? I think it's, ju it's just coming. It's just coming. <laughs> a, long, a long way from wherever you Un take. Unrivaled connectivity is about to uh, to be with you, uh, uh, Liz. <laughs> on the way to Andrew or...? or... And, and in fact, to, to, to some extent, uh, uh, both here and set the scene wonderfully because um, I think we just need, need to remind ourselves why... Uh, the previous mayor decided to set up uh, a mayoral development corporation at a place called Old Oak Park Royal. And it, it, because of pl it, it is a place that has the most amazing, or will have the most amazing, unrivaled connectivity. And, and this, uh, this slide actually illustrates where you can actually reach from the Old Oak and Park Royal area. Of course, the key to this is the interchange between HS2 and Crossrail. And, and I would have to say, you know, even as of last year, when we were at MIPIM, Andrew, uh, there, there was a lot of um, doubt, uh, you know, a, a lot of gloomy faces about what would actually happen with regard to HS2. We went through a very sort of sticky period during the end of last year, around about the election, the OCA review, OCA review. But I'm delighted to say that, you know, earlier this year, um, the government did actually, let's put it bluntly, come off the fence and decide HS2 was going to happen. Now, one or two people have said to me now, is it still going to happen, you know, in the light of COVID? Um, but when you think about this, this is going to be the most fantastic uh, infrastructure project, massive employment opportunities uh, involved, massive apprenticeship opportunities involved. Uh, it would certainly be um, a bad decision by anybody, uh, I think, to try and take HS2 um, sort of off the agenda. So HS2, absolutely key to the uh, Old Oak and Park Royal um, development. Um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, as a, if we could move on to the next slide, right? Um, I just wanted to sort of make the point that um, that particular location has a tremendous number of influential neighbours. So if you look at this in the sort of West London context, what's actually happening around us? White City, the plans at, Hammers, uh, at Hammersmith, um, the plans for Imperial College, which are absolutely fabulous, uh, and of course, Wembley Park. So this is an amazingly well-connected part of West London, which is in itself a hugely well-connected part of, of our capital. Now, um, if we move on to the next slide, this gets a tiny bit complicated. But as of this time last year, if you focus on the left hand, um, we had decided, uh, and, and I think at the time it was the right decision, that we needed to take uh, our old oak development opportunities sort of chunk by chunk, and we were going to focus very much on that yellow patch, which we called Old Oak North. Um, just to sort of set that in context, it's to the south of Willesden Junction, north of the Grand Union Canal. Uh, the HS2 station is sort of pretty well slap bang in the middle of that you can see the uh, uh see the uh, the um, bullseye um we have a, had a few difficulties i think it would be fair to say um there was a major land there is a major landowner there that runs a very expensive very successful business uh, quite rightly that landowner if he was going to be able to move his business was thinking you know he had to find an alternative uh, location not a million miles away to benefit from the employment to benefit from his his customer base uh, the rise in price of industrial land in west london was against him you know. so in the end um we have had to conclude reluctantly um and and agree indeed with that landowner that we are not going to be able to develop that site, that blob in yellow. I wonder if we could go back to that, because I want to move to the right-hand uh, 
diagram there. Okay, so we have now switched our attention from what we called Old Oak North uh, to what we're now uh, naming, not Westland, sounds a bit too much like a helicopter manufacturer, um, but in fact, the Western lands approach. So if you can imagine, we sort of moved down a bit and to the left. And, and actually, if my wonderful colleague who prepared these slides for, for me and I had had a bit longer, we'd have probably put another blob on above those two blue blobs, um, a little bit more to the to the northwest. So, so we've shifted our focus away from what we called Old, old Oak North to the Western lands, but it is still an area that benefits hugely from the connectivity um, of the station. Now, if we move on to the next slide, the big advantage of the area that we're now focusing on is that there is a huge amount of public sector land there, um, mostly in the ownership of either HS2 or network rail. And from HS2's perspective, it's what they're going to be using for uh, their work site. So we know that they will be moving off that in due course. The network rail land um, will involve, um, you know, uh, using some of their existing sites around Wilsdon Junction and between Wilsdon Junction and the HS2 station. Um, if you could just move on to the next slide, what you'll see there, um, that, uh, that that is a focus on a number of the different transport interchanges already in the area, Wilsdon Junction, Acton, HS2, um, from which, oh, and potentially a, a, an, another overground station, from which you can actually see that this is still uh, an extraordinarily well-connected area for us to, to focus on our development. So, um, what do we actually, if we move on to the next slide, what do we actually need to do in order to make things happen? Well, we've had a big piece of master planning uh, being done for us by Jason Pryor uh, and his company, looking at the potential for the area. Um, we're having some further work done looking at the financial implications of what we think the potential is. What we know we will have to do is work very closely in partnership, obviously, with our three boroughs uh, that are part of the, uh, the Mayoral Development Corporation area. We want to work with our other neighbours at Imperial. Obviously, we work with the GLA. But I think the key to this uh, is actually working with the other parts of central government. So HS2 uh, Network Rail, who are of course sort of adjuncts of the Department for Transport, to look at how we can actually manage a collective approach to the development of those sites in pink, which will form the nub uh, of our development area, of our Western land approach to um, Old Oak and Park and Park Royal. The advantage of doing it, each of those agencies could, in theory, choose to go off and sell their sites and do what they want on them. But if we could master plan uh, and be the ringmaster, the facilitator for the overall development of this area, I believe we'll be able to deliver a far better uh, master plan development than if the inv individual public sector landowners um, went off and went off and did it on their own. Um, of course, this isn't going to be easy, just in the way uh, that the Old Oak North is not going to be easy. If I could just have my last slide. I think the, the three big challenges for us, let's start with the middle one, investment, money. Anything you do in a brownfield area like this is going to involve upfront investment. Uh, and how and whether we can attract that in the post-COVID era is, is going to be absolutely key. I mean, I would hope we'd be able to persuade central government that this was a site of such importance. I mean, bear in mind, they will be investing somewhere in the order of a billion pounds in an HS2 station, which, as Ian rightly pointed out, was given planning permission only two or three weeks ago. That is a lot of government money to be putting into one site. What you would hope is the people that are going to get off that uh, HS2 train and transfer to Crossrail or do other things, will actually have the opportunity to do rather a lot more in that area than just change trains. Wouldn't it be a huge wasted opportunity uh, if we couldn't actually build a new district of London around this fabulous interconnectivity? So, so investment's going to be the big problem and, and the big challenge, and I, I can't play that down. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can't belittle that. That is going to be absolutely huge. But of course, we will also have to build on this collaborative pro approach with our partners, particularly with Network Rail HS2, and that effectively means a DFT, and dare I suggest also probably the Treasury uh, as, as well. 
And we shouldn't forget the need to engage with all local stakeholders. We don't have a huge number of residents actually on our patch because it's brownfield land. But we have a lot of people around the area who've got a very strong interest, not surprisingly, in how we develop this area. And we need to make sure we do it in a way that pays attention to their particular concerns, their particular needs. So we're setting off on a new journey in a new direction. Um, perhaps by this time next year, I'll have something more positive to tell you about you know, how far we've actually got down that road. We thought we'd gone off in one direction last year. Um, didn't turn out to be the right one. We have regrouped and come up with what I hope will be a plan. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Liz. A, a terrifically um, sort of clear and concise um, sort of tour of of that realignment that you sort of got that you've gone through, and and hopefully an interesting sort of new introduction to Westlands um, for, um, for 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 those that hadn't yet um, come across the the sort of new um, philosophy and approach that that has been emerging um, in in recent times. Now, as we move into um, our discussion, which I, I'm going to suggest we structure around um, the key ingredients of success that um, that Ian um, introduced you to, us, us all to, um, I thought it might just be worth noting by way of context that, of course, in this extraordinary um, sort of time and space that we're now inhabiting um, through the pandemic, that um, our colleagues at the West London Alliance group of boroughs um, have moved from um, intensive work on the initial um, sort of rapid emergency emergency response um, to now driving significant work um, around recovery and what that looks like and means um, for West London um, and indeed over the next few days there'll be um, key work coming through from Oxford Economics who have been commissioned to um, do an initial analysis of the economic impact um, and to start to set out and help shape some recommendations for, for the boroughs um, in terms of that um, regeneration and, and sort of recovery phase that we'll be embarking on um, very soon. The key ingredients of success we're going to once again bring up on screen I think um, just as a as a as a reminder um, transport um, the, the sites that had existing infrastructure to provide good transport connectivity with further upgrades in the pipeline land the importance of clean title and resolvable land ownership issues and funding um, the ability to fund future development by sequencing revenue opportunities to manage cash flow now ian you're back with us we lost you for a while there as uh, the the tech gremlins um sort of ate up your your internet um c connection um i wonder whether you can perhaps kick us off just by sharing some of your thoughts around the transport conundrum in the covid19 world that we're now um now living in uh, because it, it feels like certainly at the moment the way in which we're we're getting around is so very different um from from the time when you you wrote um your your report i step out of my front door and it's it's cyclists that are filling um filling the roads not 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 cars and and i look at train carriages going by and they're they're largely empty so what what does this mean yeah, well, um, thank you. And um, I hope it was the tech gremlins that cut me off and not the Ian gremlins uh, who are responsible for that. But um, you're quite right with um, your your question. Um, I think in the short term, you know, there is um, you know, an opportunity to seize in terms of the, the walking and cycling funding, which has become available. And I hope that you know, we can be agile and and help to translate that into uh, local schemes on the ground but when it comes to thinking about the the longer term we've, we've really got to wait and see uh, how uh, travel behavior and and individual uh, behavior is is going to settle down because it's it is um, quite a, a thought uh, for a lot of people to uh, to get uh, onto onto trains um, and you know, particularly if they think about air conditioning and and that although they might be doing their best to observe social distancing uh, nevertheless the mechanics of, of air conditioning may mean that uh, they would they feel exposed to um, uh, you know, people from from more than two meters away in, in terms of you know, possible uh, germs and um, and virus risk 
Uh, and of course, the whole experience of um, of you know, you're wearing face mask, possibly possibly gloves, uh, is really quite off-putting when it comes to to using public transports. And I, I do think that um, here we we have to see uh, how uh, travel patterns are are going to re-establish themselves, because that is a risk uh, affecting the the business cases. Uh, for some of those future uh, future projects which are still in or entering the the planning pipeline and of course as uh, in our report back in august we identified that transport infrastructure was often a key enabler of development then we need to think through the the implications in that the the transport infrastructure is is not just an end in itself if it has been linked with with developments then changes to that transport infrastructure will have implications for the delivery of that future development as well Th thank you ian we've we've had a, a question in from sue brown on 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 um, youtube along very similar lines kind of probing the impact of covid 19 um on on transport uh, in infrastructure um it'd be interesting to, to get your reflections too i think liz because as you said you're in, in your introduction hs2 a transport link has really been um the major catalyst um of opdc um coming to together but uh I suppose at a more day-to-day -day level, um, you also have Park Royal within your remit, um, 40,000 staff, um, a majority of whom still need to get in and out of um, production facilities on, on, on the estate. Um, and I imagine many people are very concerned about how to get to and from Park Royal safely. Liz? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with Ian. I think the, the, the whole positioning of transport for the next sort of year or two uh, is, is going to be hugely difficult. In, in fact, I was participating in an earlier session in, in Real Estate Live earlier in the week, listening to Tony Travers talking about the impact on London uh, of the, what is it, some extraordinary number of people, something like about, well, I can't remember the number, huge number of people flock into London every day from quite far afield. You know, the, I think we're the, the, the city in the world with the largest number of long distance travellers coming into London. Um, so, you know, this is, this is going to be very significant until we crack the problem of virus through either some vaccination or it is completely. Um, I, I mean, what, I, what I'm wondering about is, you know, whether, whether perhaps hubs uh, on the sort of outside edge of London are actually going to become more significant uh, as we, you know, over the next few years. People don't want to go all the way into the central zone. But you might actually start to see places um, around the periphery, you know, such as West Northwest, such as Park Royal, such as you know the, uh, the whole of the sort of West London business area, are actually easier to get to than than the centre of London. The worry in all that is that it's going to lead to increasing car use, and, and frankly, it's car use. We were all until all this happened absolutely adamant we had to try and had to try and reduce. And indeed, our plans for OPDC have always been predicated on the mayor's plans for a largely car-free uh, system of getting around, you know, modal shift away from cars onto either public transport or bikes or walking. So uh, I think we've got an immediate problem for the next couple of years. But in the longer term, um, I would expect that we will be we will be sticking to our public transport, good interconnectivity, HS2 connecting the connecting the country it might actually be easier to be on a train than in an airplane I, I it's just so difficult to where to see where this is all where this is all going just on the point of of park royal um i, I mean you know, we've been hearing about the businesses on park, park royal it is deeply distressing to see the impact of covid on so many of them um, and looking at what we can do to sort of bring short-term relief is one thing, and unfortunately, probably not a lot without any more money than the government has already been prepared to put in. But looking at the long term, how we can replan Park Royal, you know, to be more sustainable. You know, in an ideal world, we'll build 25,000 homes somewhere in Old Oak, uh, and the people will be able to cycle across the road to Park Royal, uh, which we will also hope to have invigorated with an intensification of industrial use, and we can get rid of the car. That would be perfect. But that's 10, 15, 20 years away. So, yeah, 
um, some real challenges, and I'm sorry, I don't have immediate answers to them, but I don't think we should be knocked off course of our longer term plans to, to build on the benefits created by HS2. Thank you, Liz. And, and Ian, picking up on the point around the sort of cycling sort of shift that we're witnessing at the moment, um, is your hunch that that's going to drive perhaps a shift in the balance of capital spending towards cycling to try and lock in um, the behavioural change that we're currently witnessing? Well, in, in the short term, some, some of this has, has already happened with uh, recent announcements. Uh, for additional funding for for walking and and cycling, and and that may that may well be something which is is going to be uh, sustained uh, for the for the longer term, and and it does make make us think about the relationship between transport and and land use planning, and and whether we we should be thinking uh, about planning on a on a more localized level um, I, I do take the the point about the the millions of people who, who commute into to London every day and of, of course they're they're undertaking some very long duration uh, journeys while they while they do that so you know, there are some big implications I, I think it's of course it's one thing to make money available um, you know, the focus really needs to be on on how we uh, actually achieve the delivery of of walking and cycling schemes in the in the short term, uh, and to be able to demonstrate success, uh, so there's there's a challenge there, uh, which requires some some focus to to come back on on this you know, with all the the broadband that the the public sector and and private sector partners can bring to it. Now, going back to the, the, the framework that you set out for us, um, Ian, of key ingredients for success, I'm going to take land and funding um, together, if, if I may, as the, the clock is, is ticking. Um, now, I, I'm very struck that um, whilst clearly, Liz, you had um, challenges on your hands with car giants, um, it seems that you've, you've got a new land assembly ch challenge on your hands um, with the public sector um, agencies that you're that you're working with so it'd be great to hear um, more about that but equally um, what your sense is at the moment from the conversations that you're having across um, the industry um, as to when the sort of funding and cash flow that's so critical um, to, to get sites moving um, beyond planning consent um, what what the current sort of atmosphere feels like um, in that regard Liz well, it, it's interesting, but um, th this is actually the second uh, conference I've done on the subject of, of OPDC in, in a couple of weeks. And, and after the last one, um, I had two approaches um, from people who uh, represent um, foreign investment um, who said they were extremely interested in talking about what it was we needed in terms of big infrastructure funding, you know, where these enterprises, you know, might be prepared to look at supporting that. So I, I think, ironically, there's, a, there's still a huge amount of money around the world actually looking to invest in uh, in the right sort of schemes, where in due course, you know, there will be there will be a substantial return. Now, both these prospects may turn out to be completely sort of high in the sky, but but you know that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at how we can package this in such a way that it does become an attractive proposition perhaps for a large-scale funder at the initial stages um, who could then fund the necessary infrastructure and then look at the sale of you know oven ready sites to people who could build the homes people who could build um the the, the mixed use people who could build the, the 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 specific work units i mean that would be the absolute ideal and you know that's what we need to explore over the next uh, over the next several next several months um you, you mentioned the public sector challenge i mean the, the the public sector is made up of a huge number of different agencies people outside the public sector tend to refer to it as just the public sector as if it thinks with one mind and speaks with one voice um i've worked for government for 27 years i know um, that that is not necessarily the case in fact it's not very often the case um individual ent individual undertakings within the public sector are set their own financial targets uh, and they are driven by wanting to meet those or needing to meet those financial targets 
HS2 won't come as any surprise to anybody, is under pressure because of the cost of the scheme and is therefore looking at how it can maximise the revenue from its various sites once it was actually finished constructing the railway. Uh, that's where you come back to, you could, you could achieve some short-term gains, which would be immediately beneficial to HS2. Uh, I think my view would be if you could take a slightly, or a rather longer term view, bigger picture view, you would achieve much bigger gains, which ultimately would be equally beneficial, not just to HS2, but to the economy as a whole. Um, so it's this age-old problem of not immediately going for the quick financial return, but going for the rather longer term one, um, which will actually bring wider benefit to the economy as a whole in the end. That, that's that we'll have, because I know where HS2 are coming from, and I sympathise with that. I know where Network Rail will be. You, you know, that they, they will want to maximise the value of their, of their assets. Um, I think what I'm saying is, we can help them maximise the value of their assets, but it might take a bit longer. Which ties in neatly with with Ian's next critical ingredient of, of success: patient patient capital, um, and that that eye on the on on the long term. So, Ian, I wonder whether you could share your your reflections on on how the patient capital funding and complex land assembly um, come come together in in an ideal scenario for West London. Well, the, the the feedback which we we had from our, our discussions with with developers um, really brought home to me the the importance of the the relationship between developers and their and their funders in terms of the 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 funders really understanding and and buying into the the vision for the the development uh, having fully understood. Uh, all of the all of the risks which uh, which are involved. I I know from some of the discussions that um, you know, there were you know, quite exhaustive uh, discussions you know, between developers and, and funders with the the funders wanting to get to the, the bottom of all of the all of the possible risks I involved. And of course, it's really uh, important that um, the the they fully understand that so that they they can commit for the for the long the long term and and that um you really seem to be a, a vital ingredient in being able to increase the the pace at uh, at development so that they weren't you know, the development was not purely relying on optimizing its its cash flow and taking things step by by step the the importance of uh, patient capital really came into its own when it came to being able to increase the the speed of delivery. Now, now you th thank you. Now, you, you know, your fourth ingredient of success was um, the collaborative relationships um, with a single borough or potentially mul multiple um, boroughs. Um, now, I'm very conscious in the conversations that I have with local authority planning staff of their high workloads before the, the crisis, um, which have often now become even more um, amplified um, as uh, as local authorities navigate um, COVID-19. Um, I was also struck that Liz, in her cl closing re remarks around next steps, put a very strong emphasis on the collaboration and, and partnership that's going to be um, required. So I wonder what your thoughts are on on sort of some of the, the practical steps that, that are um, critical to, to making those um, positive relationships um, happen. Um, Ian? I think having, um, having a, you know, one of the key things is is having a a good understanding of of each other's objectives uh, across public and private sector and really really trying to maximize the the alignment between those objectives clearly there are there are differences um, but it really really helps if if the area of of overlap uh, is something which can be increased and i think there there is still still work to be done in in terms of uh, you know, building that that understanding, and and it's really important to build trust uh, as as well. I think that's a, a key a key factor in terms of being able to not just go through the planning process, but be be able to to work you know, through the the post consent period. 
uh, and the and the delivery of of projects. There are examples uh, around of of projects which you know, were successful in terms of getting through the the planning process, but which faltered at at later stages um, because. Uh, the the collaboration uh, between public and private sector didn't um, didn't really get to the the right level. So it's important that this is a, a sustained collaboration, uh, not just something to get across the initial planning hur hurdles. Well, that that that's really helpful. Now I'm going to bring Ewan back in because it strikes me that you know whilst your technology has been deployed um, for West London at a fairly macro level. Um, I recollect that it's that very often you work with um, developers and other partners at a site level to help with the visualization of of individual schemes, which I imagine would support some of Ian's points on understanding objectives and building trust. So, can you tell me a bit? Tell us a bit more about uh, how, how it works. That's that's exactly it. The the aim of many of the tools are to increase engagement between private developers or, or, um, and the local communities. So what we're really looking to do is build that understanding, increase the effective engagement, build that trust up between them. Um, and digital tools help by breaking down the barriers to engagement, things like time, accessibility, inclusivity, uh, resources. So like you said, resources now are very constrained everywhere. Um, everything is exaggerated during this time. So what we're looking for is how can we take those um, uh, and, and increase that engagement to get feedback from um, from members of the local community. Now that, that... We've recently done an exercise in Sheffield, and this is on, on, a, on a larger scale, uh, looking at active travel. And we've been talking about cycling and walking, where we've had over 8,000 people participate in that exercise to provide feedback on their views towards active travel. Um, so when when you give people a voice and, and, a, and a method to do it, they they really do want to participate and and build up that that engagement. And I know from my own experience of sometimes trying to download all all the diagrams, the reams of paperwork attached to individual planning applications, it can be quite overwhelming. <laughs> um, and uh, clearly, your your platform simplifies it to help uh, help members of the public pick up on the the essential points they might want to consider and feedback on. That's it. There's nothing worse than receiving those big reams of paper and the reports to go through. And especially if you're a lay person, you don't really understand those. Uh, so being able to visualize it easily, being able to navigate around, see lots of different things at the same time uh, uh, for the same place really helps get that understanding across. Th thank you, Ewan. Now, and we've got just a few more minutes um, to hone in um, on the last two um key ingredients for success, cultural assets um, and infrastructure. Um, now, we were talking, in fact, on a West London Business um, webcast just earlier today, um, the huge impacts that have been felt in our cultural sector in West London um, as a re result of, um, of, of COVID-19. Um, but it strikes me there's there's perhaps two dimensions to this. There's both um, the, the, the content um, that is being generated by um, non-profit and, 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 and private sector um, organisations across um, our part of, of the capital. But there's also the brand dimension, which I think you draw out particularly in your report, um, Ian. And I wondered, Liz, what your um, reflections are on how the Park Royal and the Old Oak brands might evolve in the um, in, in in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Yes, it's a it, it's an interesting one. I mean, we we have actually done quite a lot of work uh, on sort of building the building the Park Royal brand. You know, we 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 have there the most extraordinary industrial estate that far too few people know about, and far too few people know about its history, uh, and and the brands that have come out of there. You know, the biscuits, the London buses. Um, there, there is a wonderful building called the Torpedo Factory. You know, do, does anybody really know where what the history of that? Uh, what the history of that is? So we've actually been very lucky and had um, national lottery money, um, arts council money to actually look at exploring the cultural heritage of Park Royal um, and, and produce some rather interesting artists' commissions based around, based around Park Royal. Um, you know, and we're continuing to build on that 
um, we, we produce videos, we produce sort of events all about what is made in Park Royal and why it is actually important to uh, important to London. And, and I think also I'd, I'd like to bring out in the future um, the the importance of the railways to West London and how they have actually uh, led to to the development. You know, the ra railways made that area of West London. Uh, they may actually be about to make it again, you know, in the in the context of HS2. But we've got some fascinating railway architecture, the railway cottages uh, around Old Oak Lane and all and all around there. So, so culture and history, I think, is really important. I had actually suggested to the Museum of London that they might start thinking about possibly not for the moment because they've got other things on their mind, but they might in the future start thinking about a Western a West London outpost in the way they have an East London outpost. You know, because a huge a huge amount has happened in in West London over the years, so I think there's a lot to there's a lot to play for. You know, as as well as um, the modern cultural institutions that are all going to need support in the in the post COVID era. Now, now, if my memory serves me correctly, um, Liz, I think there's been an artist in residence at the um, McVitie's factory in Park Royal off the back of uh, of, of, of the, one of the programmes you, you, you mentioned. And I, I discovered in the process that it's the second la largest biscuit factory in the world by volume, can you believe? <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I didn't. I didn't actually. I didn't know that. I, I, yes, indeed, there's been an artist in resident, and you'll just forgive me. I'm just reaching to get off my notice board. And I don't know whether this will this will show up on your whoops on your on your pic on your webcast. I don't know whether whether you can home in on that. The, the, this is the. Mm, it's not very good, I'm afraid. But you'll have to look on the website. This is the tapestry that we actually commissioned. Uh, as as part of our, um, uh, our our heritage project within within Park Royal, um, which you know took all lots of local people, different sorts of local people, and combined them into this most uh, most beautiful tapestry. Um, said powered by OPDC. It's been on display at Brent Civic Centre for some uh, time. One, one, wonderful. We, we're all going to have to search it out now and uh, be up to, to see it uh, up, up close. <laughs> now. I <laughs> We're getting close to the top of the hour, but I have a final question, possibly a toughie, that I'm going to put to Ian first and then come back to, to, to you, Liz. Um, and, and that is that given just how much the world has changed since you published this report back in the autumn of 2019, um, do you think this is still the right list of, of critical ingredients of success? Is there anything that you'd like to add in there as, as an extra item now? What, what's, what's your gut feel, Ian? Well, <laughs> that's a it's a tough question. <laughs> it's not the question we agreed, Andrew. <laughs> only, only, only joking. But um, I, I, I think that um, digital infrastructure is is something which you would really come onto this list, and 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 rise up. Just you know, thinking back, uh, because. Uh, clearly, uh, the the use of of digital infrastructure has been accelerated over the the last few months, and we we need to see it in in all of its forms. Your data centres, networks. We need to see it as an enabler of of economic activity and social social life, uh, but spanning across all sectors of the of the economy and the. The great advantage of um, of digital infrastructure, particularly when you compare it to fixed mass transit infrastructure, is is the inherent flexibility of uh, digital uh, in in terms of enabling so many other activities. And, and I've I've been struck with so many of us now working from home that the um, sort of divide between and choice between investing in commercial digital infrastructure versus um, residential properties is a false divide. It's just got to happen every everywhere right now. <laughs> Liz, what are your thoughts? Have we got the right list? Um, I saw you nodding to Ian's point yeah. around di digital infrastructure. Yeah. I think two points. Uh, first of all, on digital infrastructure. So, looking at somewhere like, like Park Royal, um, you know, we, we have been struck by the conversations we've had with the business over the last couple of years about how poor the digital infrastructure has been, and we've been putting a huge amount of effort, pulling in money from you know every corner we can find, uh, to actually look at um, uh, um, fibre improvement, you know, for for Park Royal, so we can actually 
actually help those businesses. And that seems, you know, given where we are in the technological world, um, that seems a pretty basic thing to get into what, what is one of the, well, I think probably the largest sort of business park in London. So that's an existing challenge and that's something we need to keep going at. And hopefully we might get a bit of a, a bit of a boost in the light of in the light of, of COVID and the need for this better, um, uh, better connectivity um, virtually. But I think to go back to your, your question, I think broadly speaking, uh, I think Ian's list of, of requirements is, is, is absolutely right uh, and, and still absolutely applies to, to certainly the project I'm dealing with. I suppose the one I would perhaps sort of talk up, add, sort of expand, it, it is about getting the right political will um, behind behind something. Uh, and, and I think it's actually been unfortunate that there's perhaps been a lack of political alignment between uh, the politicians in City Hall and the politicians in Whitehall, you know, for obvious reasons, party reasons and all that sort of thing. Uh, but I think, you know, propositions suffer when you don't have all the politicians supporting and pointing in the in the same direction. So I think that's going to be hugely important because it's going to, in the future because there's going to be competition for scarce resources. And, and if we're to promote West London, and obviously I'm particularly interested in, in promoting the OPDC project, uh, I, I need to see our mayor and our treasury uh, and, and MHCLG and Bayes and DFT and HS2 all pointing in the same direction. So we, we need um, big political support. Our hour is up. Um, the time has flown by, but uh, goodness, we've covered um, a lot of ground there. Um, for me, it's just to say a huge thank you, as always, to my production team, Pim and Janelle at West London Business and Joel at Revolution Audio. And thank you to uh, our panel um, this afternoon, Liz Peace, Chair of the Old Oak and Park Royal Development Corporation, Ian Liddle, Managing Director of Planning and Advisory at WSP, uh, and Ewan Lloyd-Smith, Director at D2. In a few minutes, our panel and some guests will be joining us for further discussion under the Chatham House rule on Zoom. Um, so we look forward to seeing you there shortly, possibly with a, a glass of wine or two. Um, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, um, please click on the button below the video stream to stay informed and show your support for our work. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's webcasts as part of Real Estate Live UK. Do go to the website realestatelive.co.uk to register for tomorrow's last day of sessions and visit westlondon.com to register for our rolling programme of online events through 2020.